All right, well, let's jump into the next session because who knows how long it'll take to get through all of Second John, but we're going to try to keep it to the allotted time. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll launch right in. Dear Father, we thank you for uh, not one, but three letters from John, plus his gospel and the wonderful book of Revelation. Uh, we thank you for um, all that we can learn from these epistles. Uh, we thank you for the heart and witness of John. And we do uh, thank you that you've preserved these, uh, these testimonies to your word so that we might learn and grow by them. We do praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. This is Second John, the second epistle of John. And uh, I'm going to start out with a theory here of the origins of Second John. And uh, by that, I might preface by saying Second John may be a misleading title, um, especially if we're thinking of it in second in sequ uh, sequence, because uh, it may have been written second, but it was likely circulated together with First John. First, when we look into history and the historical records that we have of the transmission of these books, Second John was often treated as part of First John. Irenaeus, uh, who uh, witnessed around AD 180, quotes 1st and 2nd John as if they were a single book. Aurelius of Chalabi at the Council of Carthage stood up and spoke in AD 256 and quoted 2nd John 10 through 11 and then cited the Epistle of John. Early mentions of the Epistles of John we see that 1 John likely existed alone, but it also existed together with 2 John, closely attached. We've also noted that 1 John begins without an introduction. There are probably a few reasons for this, one of them being that John probably did not write this with the intention or prepare this with the intention of it being sent out, but once it was preached in his own local church, it was written down and prepared to be sent out to other churches by the addition of 2 John to it. As an elder, he sent it to other churches with an attached letter of introduction. Therefore, 2 John serves as a cover letter for 1 John. 2 John and 1 John have a much closer connection to one another than 3 John has to them. As well, these churches may not have had a full-time teaching elder, since uh, the occasion of these letters concerned hosting guest teachers. And so these guest teachers may be, uh, uh, well, as we've seen with these deceivers, is these guest teachers or uh, people promising to bring the gospel uh, to these small home churches. Uh, John gave them some instruction as to uh, how to properly receive these teachers. And so 2 John condenses much of the doctrine of 1 John and likely serves as the epistolary greeting absent in the text of 1 John. This letter helps us understand what points were important to John in his greater letter. Significantly, the outline of 2 John corresponds with the various purpose statements of 1 John. So the things that John highlights in 2 John are also highlighted in 1 John. For example, the fellowship of abiding in truth and love. 2 John verses 1 through 3 corresponds with 1 John 1, 1 through 2, 2, especially in uh, 1 John 1, 3. The importance of the believer's walk in obedience. 2 John 4, 1 through 6 corresponds with 1 John 2, 3 through 17, and especially verse 7. The necessity of avoiding false teachers from 2 John 7 through 11 corresponds with 1 John 1, 28 through 27, and especially in 2, 27, and the correspondence or consequence of losing fellowship, confidence, and reward for drifting off into false doctrine uh, in 2 John 8 summarizes the rest of 1 John. So let's look at the to and the from of this letter. He introduces himself as the elder. Remember in 2 John, he never addresses himself by name. He never addresses himself at all by any sort of title. He just begins telling us his qualifications. 
it would be unnecessary to include a title for himself or a uh, description of himself in 2 John if this were the cover letter to those outside of his own local church. Also, Eusebius, quoting Origen, speaks about this uh, book of John, attributing this second letter of John to the Apostle John. Uh, Eusebius writes, What shall we say of him who reclined upon the breast of Jesus, I mean John, who has left one gospel in which he confesses that he could write so many that the whole world could not contain them? He also wrote the Apocalypse, commanded as he was to conceal and not to write the voices of the seven thunders. You'll remember from uh, Revelation chapter 10 there. He continues, he has also left an epistle consisting of very few lines. Suppose also that a second and third is from him, for not all agree that they are genuine, but both together do not contain a hundred lines. Um, also interestingly, and I don't know, Jacob might bring this up in the next session, of these three epistles, the first epistle, the larger epistle, is almost unanimously accepted as canonical. Everybody agrees this is uh, an original writing of John. Second and third, John, receive diminishing acceptance. Second John, a little less than first John. And third John, considerably less accept, uh, ex acceptance. And that's because people reference first John and second John and very rarely 3rd John. That's why Eusebius adds into here that there may have been a third letter of John. But the references to the two letters of John, 1st and 2nd John, it may be that 2nd John was considered part of 1st, and therefore what we know today as 3rd John was originally considered 2nd John until they were separated. Well, 2nd John, verse 1, begins with the elder, or uh, ha presbyteros, which we see as well in other places, especially in the book of Acts. And we see that as Acts progresses through its, uh, through its books, I cut a few verses for the sake of time from here, but earlier on in Acts, we see the apostles and the elders clearly distinguished. It says the apostles and the brethren who are elders. Uh, but later on in Acts, starting in 15 and moving forward, we see a blending of these apostles and elders. Not that the elders are becoming apostles, but that the apostles are settling into their roles in local churches as elders. Peter, for example, in the mid-60s writes, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. The apostles had been given uh, various tasks, one of which was to record and uh, preserve the uh, written word of God in the New Testament. And as these uh, epistles and such and gospels had been completed, their job started shifting from writing and recording and bringing new doctrine to shepherding and leading by example in these local congregations. So when we see John in the 90s AD, doing this, his position as an elder is far more significant than his position as an apostle. Although he is bringing uh, revelation to them, he continually tells them, this isn't anything new. This is what I've told you since the very beginning. He's emphasizing that he is bringing to them the same message that they've been told from, uh, from the beginning of the gospel message. And Jude, who writes in the late 80s as well, does this also, where he says this is the I uh, can't remember exactly the word of God handed down um, by the apostles, basically, once for all. And so these elders who are functioning among them now, John included, are taking care of their local church bodies. Acts in, or Paul in Acts 20, verse 17 says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church, and he, tells, or he says to them, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so that's what John is focused on here. Uh, he is focused on his uh, shepherding role in these local churches. 
And now the addressee of the book is the chosen lady. And uh, it is sent to her children as well. This has been perhaps the uh, cause of more consternation than the elder. There are many theories as to who this lady is. Uh, in fact, some, some believe that it might be the uh, lady whose name was Electa, which is the Greek word for chosen, or it could be the, uh, the chosen lady or the chosen lady whose name is Curia, uh, based on the Greek term uh, eklekte curia. Some of the best explanations, actually some of the explanations and not all of them are best. Uh, one is that this is a natural family, an actual woman with her actual biological children. In this theory, there are two uh, additional theories that it is a known woman, a woman who's actually identified, and that, the, that it is an anonymous woman as well. One of the known women theories even uh, proposes that this is the uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and that her name was changed to Kyria or Electa um, in order to avoid persecution in the Roman world. Uh, this is uh, very dubious, primarily because it's, it's a very strained reading of the Greek text here. This is the chosen lady. These are not identifying names, but this is a second attributive uh, construction, which says that this lady is identified by her adjective, which is chosen. Uh, so it is, oh, sorry, that looks forward into 2.13. The same construction, this sister who is uh, eclectes, uh, notice in 2.13 then as well, this is the children of your chosen sister, uh, and they greet you. The chosen sister would otherwise be named the same exact thing as her sister, so you'd have two sisters named eclecta if this is a woman named eclecta, uh, and that is rather ridiculous. Uh, so in, in two. John 1, the chosen lady, the lady Electa, with a sister also named Electa. That's not a good solution. It could be an anonymous woman, a woman who we don't know her name. She's just simply called chosen. A couple problems exist with this. Uh, one is not really a problem so much as an observation. If this is written to an actual woman, it's the only book in the entire Bible written to a woman, uh, or the only letter John does not avoid naming names of known people either. So if this is a woman that we know, or even a woman that he knows who we don't, uh, such as, although I think uh, Jacob might try to solve this one, we don't know who Gaius is in Third John. Uh, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. In Third John 9, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. And in 3 John 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. John doesn't shy away from naming people with their names. So this is likely not a named person because of uh, the chosen sister as well. And also, it's, it's likely, uh, it is likely uh, not an anonymous woman either because... John names names. A better explanation of this is that it refers to a spiritual family rather than a natural family. Most likely a local church. This would correspond very well with John's use of the vocatives or nominatives of a direct address in his extended family metaphor in 1 John. We've seen these vocatives and almost all of them correspond with family relationships. Remember, the only one that does not is the, uh, the technia, the, uh, the kids. Everything else, fathers, children, uh, even brothers, and to an extent, even beloved. Not only that, but in 2 John 5, uh, she was referred to as the curia as well. Or this Curia, this lady, this mother, uh, in 1 John 3, 1, uh, we are all called children of God to the Father. And in 1 John 4, 21, we're considered one another's brothers as well. One very good reason for why John may have chosen this appellation for the 
local church body he's sending this to is because of the doctrine of identity with Christ that he stresses throughout his gospel or throughout his epistle. This term curia that he uses for lady is not the normal term for lady in the New Testament. In fact, in the New Testament, this is the only place it is used for lady, whereas gune is used 231 times. This is a very unique term to address a woman, and it corresponds very well with the title of the Lord, Kurios. This probably has more to do with our identity in Christ. Remember 1 John 4.17 told us, By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. And John 17, 20 through 21, John extending the message that he had given to the apostles to the benefit of the believers who would hear their words and believe, says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, why do I say it's the local church and not a universal church? Once again, we look at 2 John 13. Whoever this lady is, has a sister. The church has no sister. However, local churches have local church sisters, you might say, in this metaphor of John. And so this is not writing to the church universal, but the local bodies to whom he is circulating this letter to. Third John is not going to uh, write to such an extensive crowd. This will not be a circular letter. He'll direct it right to a single man, Gaius, for a singular circumstance that has occurred at one of these churches. However, this one, as a likely cover letter for 1 John, was circulated to all of the churches. I don't know what uh, theory Jacob will land on for the occasion of the writing of 3 John, uh, but I think it very likely that 3 John was a response to the to 1 John being rejected by one of the churches that it was sent to. All right, let's jump into the content of the letter before we get uh, any later in our time here, uh, into this introduction where he says, uh, to the elder, of the, chose, uh, the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth. Now he's adding an emphasis on truth in 2 John, it's not that he did not speak of truth in 1 John, he just doesn't name it by name. Uh, he tells them what to believe, and naturally those things are true. It is the testimony of God. And so now he is summarizing in his cover letter that he loves these children and the chosen lady in truth. This in truth is a dative of instrument, meaning that he loves them by means of truth the truth that he is sending to them. Not only does he love them in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth. Remember in 2 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, shows us what it means to know the truth or to know God, and that is that we would walk like him. And so all those who know this truth, all those who have rested in the finished work of Christ, as is testified in his word, have grown, and the result of that is love in the body of Christ. And so as they continue to rest in that truth, they love their brothers and sisters in that truth. And so in verse 2 he says, For the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. That truth which abides in us, again, as 1 John 5, 20, we saw Jacob uh, mentioned just a few minutes ago, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is that truth that we are in and that abides in us, and it will be with us forever. That's his brief introduction now he gives them a, uh, a greeting of um, grace, mercy, and peace. Um, and this actually is a, uh, is a command of sorts. It's not simply these, uh, these nouns put up in a vocative tense or a vocative uh, invocatives, but rather he says, let this be true. 
grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. These three terms in all of John's writings, including his gospel and revelation, almost never occur. This is one of the unique places where John specifically writes the word grace, writes the word mercy, and writes the word peace. I think it's one or two times elsewhere. Uh, for grace, I know it's the end of John's gospel. But what is grace, mercy, and peace, and why are they so important to John here as summaries? Well, everything that he's told us so far in 1 John corresponds with these doctrines of grace, mercy, and peace. Only now he's giving us the shorthand by identifying them by name rather than description. Grace is receiving a good thing which we do not deserve. Correspondingly, mercy is not receiving punishment which we do deserve. These are two sides of the same coin, something God holds in one hand, uh, not giving us the things we deserve and giving us instead the things that Christ has earned and we have not. Peace is also a, a very nice uh, capstone on these two ideas because peace is the restoration of harmony through salvation restored, uh, offered to on the basis of Christ's work on the cross. So these three things working together, grace, a gift we receive from God based on Christ's finished work, mercy, a gift we receive from God based on Christ's finished work, and peace, the result of the gift of salvation received through faith in Christ's finished work. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. This is our introduction to faith, uh, into the faith that we now stand in our position. As we stand in this position in Christ, we are matured by his word. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. This is the source of that grace, mercy, and peace. It's not something we must or, or uh, make within our own uh, congregations. It's something that is the natural result of resting in the Lord. And this, again, is in truth and love. Now, as I've mentioned, 2 John emphasizes quite a bit the correspondence between truth and love. And too often in our Western culture, and probably in the Eastern cultures, but I, I don't know them as well, we look at truth and love as something to balance, especially in the culture as we look out and we say, we just got to love people, and sometimes that means accepting their truth. Well, there's no such thing as their truth, and the least loving thing we can do is let them live in a false reality especially one which divorces them from God. Truth and love are not two things we balance, but two things that are necessary to be held together. Without truth, we don't have true love, at least not the divine love of God. And without love, we don't have truth, because as we've seen, truth naturally leads to love. If it's truth that God has revealed and we're resting in it, the result of that is love. And as we've noted throughout, we can identify whether or not we are resting in that truth, if we see love resulting. And so I'll use this explanation or an illustration. If you go to somebody's house after they've uh, offered you a dinner invite and they put this out on the table and they say, eat up. Would you like a nice spoonful of salt? Or to eat a nice raw egg? Well, this is truth without love. Or how about if you uh, go hang out in the living room with their children and they offer you these plastic pieces of food? Well, this is love without truth. It's fake. It's not real. What truth and love looks like together is a nice piece of chocolate cake. Truth works together to result in love. And love is the real deal. When love has resulted. We've had the real deal. John continues now to give commandments to the lady and her children. He says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. This some of may be a partitive, meaning he didn't find all of them walking in truth. However, the ones that he did find walking in truth, this did bring him gladness. His goal here seems to be that the rest would come into walking in this truth as well. 
the truth that they're to walk in, remember 1 John 1, 7 relates it to light. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sins. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And Jesus, we can see in many instances in the gospel, loved by means of truth. He didn't always come and uh, tell you the things you wanted to hear. In fact, many of the things he had to say were so off-putting by people because it's not what they ex expected. It's not what they wanted to accept. However, that was a means of loving those whom he had come to save. Because apart from truth, apart from reality, apart from him, there is no true love. And so he says, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, and this walking in truth is just as we have received a commandment from the Father to do. That's what we were told to do. Walk by means of this truth. And so he says, now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which you have had from the beginning. This sounds rather familiar. 1 John 2, 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. In verse 8, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The old commandment, or the, uh, uh, that this is a, see, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment. It's not new doctrine that they're unfamiliar with. It's something they know. It's something they've heard already. He's just reminding them. Uh, it is one which they have heard from the beginning, the beginning of their uh, their knowledge of the truth. That commandment was that we love one another. Remember Jesus in John 13, 34 said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love, if you have love for one another. And remember, this is true in him, and in you. This love is found only in him, and as we are in him, this love naturally flows out. And he goes on to define what this looks like, and uh, this is really, I think, wrapping a nice little bow on 1 John. He says, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. We're to love God, not just our fellow believers. In fact, Loving God is really the basis of loving our fellow believers. But in 1 John, the continual command is to believe in God and to love our brothers and sisters. But his commandment to us is to believe and to love them. How do we love God? We love him by keeping his commandments to believe and to love. This is how we demonstrate that love to him. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it, he summarizes. And now he comes to the warning passage of his letter. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. This is a purpose statement here. This is why he's writing this. This is why he's sending it out to the other uh, churches. Whether or not this is why he wrote 1 John, we don't know, but this is the purpose for him sending it to the other uh, congregations. Many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. Remember, this is a dangerous doctrine. This undermines the sufficiency of Christ. It undermines his work on the cross. It undermines who he is. It was promoted primarily by the Gnostics or the proto-Gnostics, and you're probably getting sick of hearing them by now, but I thought I'd give you a picture of what Serenthus actually looked like. Uh, this is the shifty little man, Serenthus, and uh, there is almost a... Uh, a Hollywood-style feud between him and John, as uh, Irenaeus writes and tells us. These two lived in uh, neighboring towns, and uh, John was constantly coming up against Serenthus' teaching, um, calling him a heretic and whatnot, as he well deserved. But there was one particular instance in which John was in a bathhouse and Serenthus entered, and John ran out screaming like a mad person for fear of God bringing down wrath on Serinthus in the bathhouse while he was in there with him. 
He feared so much God's judgment on Serinthus. Whether or not that's a true story, we don't know. But Irenaeus, um, who knew of John through Polycarp, the disciple of John, uh, wrote that it was true. So there may be a, at least a kernel of truth in that. I like to think there is. Um, but anyways, this is basically John's arch nemesis, Serinthus, from the city of Smyrna. This man believed that the man Jesus and the divine Christ spirit were distinct beings. There was no hypostatic union. Additionally, he believed the divine Christ descended on the man Jesus after his baptism. And he believed that the divine Christ departed from the man Jesus before his crucifixion. Now, I didn't mention when we were in uh, 1 John 5, 7, that John notes that Jesus came through water and through blood. Didn't start at the water. He didn't stop at the blood. But he went through both of them. The divine Christ spirit is a myth. There is no divine Christ spirit. There is the divine God-man, Jesus Christ. He is perfectly God and perfectly man. As a man, he's able to stand substitute for the race of Adam. And as a divine uh, member of the Trinity, he is valuable enough to pay for the sins of all mankind. This one who comes and preaches that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Now these two terms we've seen in 1 John. We've seen John warning the children, or the kids, from falling into their false doctrines. We even see him uh, emphasize at the end of his first epistle as the most important thing he wants them to walk away with, little children, guard yourselves from idols. This false Christ that Serinthus and the other proto-Gnostics are bringing to early Asia Minor, these are idols, different things that they can worship that are not the true Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 8, watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished. What they've accomplished is maturity in Christ. But that you may receive a full reward. Now the doctrine of rewards is one that is replete throughout the New Testament, particularly. Uh, 1 John 2, 28 seems to make reference to it as well, though not as explicitly. He says, Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Now this shame won't be penal judgments at the judgment seat of Christ. We won't lose anything, have our, anything taken away from us, be whipped and beaten and brutalized or thrown into outer darkness. None of that. But at the moment we see Christ and we're conformed to his image and we recognize how much time and how much opportunity we've wasted in this world believing things that aren't true, despite the fact that we have been delivered with truth despite the fact that we've been given all that we need for life and godliness, to have put our faith in something else, how worthless was that? That's the only shame we could experience. Because at the moment that we see him, we will be conformed to him. We will be like him perfectly. And as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we won't be judged for our, uh, the wrong things that we do. We won't be judged for our sins. Those have been taken care of in him but rather we will be rewarded for what he was able to do as we rested in him. How we availed ourselves to him and let him work through us rather than trying to take the reins and do it ourselves. Because everything he produces through us is valuable, of eternal value. And everything we try to make ourselves is without value. 1 Corinthians 3.12 is probably the best place to go in the New Testament uh, for this doctrine of rewards. Where Paul writes, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So very significantly, it's not just the works that we're doing, but the works that are being built on top of a foundation. Now, I purposefully didn't include 1 Corinthians 3.11, because although I'm sure you've read these verses over and over and over and over again, I'm 
I'm kind of weighing on the element of surprise here. What is this foundation that these works are built on? Well, these are the works that uh, will be revealed through fire. If you put hay, wood, stubble through fire, what happens? It all burns up, right? What you're left with is ashes. This is what happens when you put human works through the judgment of God. They're worthless. You're not punished for them, but they're not counted to your account. Why? Because they have no eternal value. As, uh, as Paul and Isaiah both very crassly say, they're worthless, dirty, filthy rags, like diapers we should throw away. Human works, even the best, most righteous by human standards, fail to measure up to the perfect righteous standard of God. And that is all that is worthy of heaven is the perfect righteous standard of God. Paul continues and he says, if any man's work which he has built on it, the foundation remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as though through fire. So if he builds up instead, or rather rests in Christ, as Christ builds a magnificent mansion in this person's soul, what happens? It's not burnt up because it's of eternal value. It's not the work of man's hands, it's the work of God's hands. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Paul came preaching what? What did he tell us he came preaching in 1 Corinthians 2? The simplicity of the gospel. So that our faith would rest not on the wisdom of men, but on the power of the Spirit. So he says, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Why is it that when all other things are burned up, we ourselves will be saved, yet as though through fire? Because we are identified with Christ. He is the perfect foundation, and not only that, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We've already been made new creatures. This is the perfect work of God through Christ toward us. We've been remade, and what we are now made of is of eternal value because it's identified with him. We will make it through the judgment of Christ without losing anything of his. It's all this worthless human righteousness we try to bring with us that, thank God, will be burned up in the judgment so that it's not weighing us down so that that's not sitting between us and Christ, so that we're not looking at ourselves for eternity, but looking at him and his glory and his majesty. In verse 9, he says, Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The revelation that God gave to the apostles is limited. It's what we need to know. It's a finished, finite corpus of revelation. Now, it's not all the truth that exists. God is infinite, and he is truth. But this is what he's chosen to reveal to us. This is what we can place our hat on and say, at the end of the day, that's what I can know for sure. But some would come around saying that you can know other things for sure, too. It's revealed to us through secrets and through whispers and through deep uh, knowledge. I think uh, 1 Corinthians 2 is speaking of that as well. But we have here kind of an image of truth fitting within a confined circle. It fits between the two covers of our Bibles. This is special revelation, how God has revealed a divine interpretation of the world around us. Anything which claims to be that truth but doesn't fit within that circle is a lie. It's outside it has overshot, it goes too far. God being infinite is infinite truth and is able to speak truth infinitely. But man is finite and has only the truth that has been revealed to him from God, this special and general revelation. 
And when man runs out of truth, that in the deficit of his finite nature, he has to fill it with lies. And we do this all the time. We all live in reality, and what we don't understand of reality, we either learn or we make up. I'm sure we've all met people, and I'm sure we've all been at stages in our own lives where our reality does not cohere with reality. The world we live in is not the world everyone else lives in. Unfortunately, it seems to be that most of the world does not live in reality right now. They've had to fill in what they lack of truth with lies because they have rejected the only perfect source of truth. 2 John 2.10, which we'll get to in a second, says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, remember these used car salesmen, snake oil salesmen, they come trying to sell you something. If it's not the same truth that you've heard from the beginning, it's not true. If it's different from that, it's wrong. It's not additions to truth if it contradicts the truth. John 8, 31 says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, these deceivers and antichrists are coming, but they've left the apostolic doctrine that was once for all handed down to the saints. They've gone outside of it, and they said, Come here, my new teaching, the deep things of God that he's taught me in secret. This is Gnosticism. The problem is when you open the box, there's nothing in it. It's a false promise. It's false teaching. It's not the deep things of God. It's the deep things of Satan. This is not godly wisdom. This is not heavenly wisdom. It's earthly, natural, and demonic wisdom. The one who abides in the teaching of Christ, however, has both the Father and the Son. If you continue in that teaching, you continue to abide in the Father and in the Son, you're in fellowship with them, and when you share the gospel, you have the true gospel. When you believe the gospel, you're believing the true gospel. Only if it's the gospel revealed by God, by the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, recorded in Scripture. Verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house, and do not give him a greeting. This seems very harsh, and as you read commentaries on 2 John, they all tried to minimize what this means by saying, well, greeting doesn't actually mean saying hello, or greeting doesn't mean uh, shutting the door and telling him to get lost or whatnot. Uh, this, this greeting might mean uh, uh, don't give them money. This greeting might mean you can uh, see them, talk to them, but just don't shake their hand. No. If a false teacher comes to your congregation trying to teach false things, don't let them in the door. Exercise church discipline. Eject them from the congregation. They are not there to learn. They are there to teach. And they're not there to teach God's word. They're there to teach doctrines of demons. Get them out from among them. Remember, this is speaking to the lady and her children, a local church body. Do not give a greeting to false teachers. Do not let them in your congregation. Do not let them teach. Do not extend to them the right hand of fellowship. 1 John 1, 8 through 9. That can't be right. No, that's Galatians 1, 8 through 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again. Now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Do not give him a greeting. Do not let him through the door. Why? For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. This word participates, again, is koinone, the verb for koinonia, which is fellowship. If you're greeting these false teachers, allowing them to have fellowship with you, you're having fellowship with them too. You're participating in the wickedness that they're doing. You're giving them a platform. You're giving them an opportunity to spread false doctrine, which rejects Christ. 
Rather, the fellowship we should have is with the apostles, with the word that they handed down, because their fellowship was with the Father, and his fellowship was with Christ. John's conclusion is brief, and he uh, writes almost the same conclusion to 3 John. He says, though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. His longing and his desire, just like Paul so often in his epistles, is to be presently with these uh, local churches, to be with these believers, to spend time with them. He truly does love the people he's writing to, not just in word, but in truth as well. And indeed, he wants to be in their presence. Maybe some of them aren't the most enjoyable people to be around, but they're God's children. And he loves God, and he wants to be with God's people. He gives this local church or these local churches to whom he's writing a greeting, the children of your chosen sister greet you. This chosen sister is probably the local congregation in which John ministered, most likely Ephesus at this point. And so one church to another church, standing on the word of God, have fellowship with one another, not fellowship with the wicked, false doctrines of the deceivers, the antichrists, but the one true gospel of Jesus Christ and the eternal life that it promises. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful little epistle. The shortest, uh, I believe, in the entire Bible. Uh, can't remember if that's true, but I think that is true. Uh, how much doctrine you've packed into these few little verses. Uh, we do thank you for each one of them. We thank you for this uh, summary of information and uh, the, the truth and security that it teaches our souls. We do praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.